I'll add my welcome to everyone here. We're glad you're here. Um, since Doretta has said something about the grant, let me say only one more thing about it. The purpose of the grant is to um, ask scholars from uh, continents associated with our church studies programs to help us understand the life of the church in their context and to describe the source of religious diversity uh, which, their, which the church in that context is encountering. So as a consummate churchman and fine scholar, Dr. Arce is especially qualified to serve in this capacity at Bright this semester. Uh, Dr. Arce received his doctoral degree in theology from Germany, uh, in Germany, where he studied with Jürgen Moltmann. This semester he's teaching a seminar, Jürgen Moltmann and the Contextuality of Doing Theology, a critical dialogue for our respective contexts. Dr. Arce is a ruling elder at the Presbyterian Reformed Church in Cuba. He has held important positions in behalf of the life of that denomination in Cuba. He also served six years as president of the Cuban Council of Churches, which allowed him to have a major role in representing religious life and issues and interpreting the needs of the religious community to the government of Cuba. For the past 11 years, Dr. Arce served as professor of theology and president of the Evangelical Theological Seminary in Matanzas, which is a progressive, interdenominational Protestant seminary about 100 kilometers east of Havana. The seminary was founded in 1946 by Presbyterians, Episcopalians, and Baptists, and is now serving Presbyterians, Episcopalians, Quakers, Baptists, and also offers programs for Pentecostals. The seminary at its various sites prepares students for ministry and lay leadership. The approximately 450 students at the seminary represent all areas of Cuba as well as the Caribbean. Included in this number, are students studying at the Ecumenical Institute of Science and Religions in Havana, which was instituted by Dr. Arce. These programs prepare students for interreligious work. Dr. Arce has just completed his term as president, and he will return to full-time teaching next fall. With Renaria this semester is his wife, Patricia Harris, a professor of psychology at the University of Havana, who is also teaching Bright students this fall. In the spring semester, Dr. Arce and Dr. Harris will teach in Toronto at Knox College, which is part of the University of Toronto and affiliated with the Presbyterian Church of Canada. Following his lecture, Dr. Arce will welcome your questions. We'll have microphones to assure that all of us can hear the questions, and we hope you'll stay after the lecture to enjoy reception and more conversation. We're also pleased that tonight's lecture is being videotaped and probably next week will be available on the Bright website. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Renario Arce. Thank you very much. And thank you all for giving us the opportunity, Patricia and I, to be with you here. Uh, the hospitality. And the friendship is, has been wonderful for us all these days. Uh, and uh, I was, when I wrote to Nancy, um, I said it will be a, a cultural experience for us. And it has been, no? Uh, from the football game on Saturday to uh, speaking by telephone to a machine. <laughs> and uh, hearing also discussions that we wonder now in, in, in different moments, but really have been a cultural experience, but a very positive cultural experience. And Nancy told me that uh, as Cubans, I will be able to speak about three hours, you said? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we're famous, we speak two hours, but especially our former president. He speaks a lot. No, don't worry. I'll, I'll, my idea tonight is to uh, give a presentation as brief as possible that a Cuban can do, and uh, then have the opportunity for you to ask questions. Uh, we're living in a, a very, the world right now, we're living in a special moment, I think, with a lot of challenges for the churches and for the Christians. And in Cuba, we are also living 
very special moment. Uh, after, you know, Cuba was the last, uh, or one of the last uh, socialist countries that still is in his system, belonging to the, what was called the, the group of socialist countries related with the, so the, the former Soviet Union. And after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the fall of the, of the system, Cuba uh, went into a big, big economical crisis. Uh, you can imagine that 90% of our uh, economical relation was with the Soviet Union. And that dropped in, from one day to another. So that caused uh, an enormous crisis in our people. But we have been in a process of uh, transformation for the last maybe six, seven, eight years with economical changes. Our people have been suffering from this economical crisis, but at the same time, the new changes have been problematic for a great number of persons in Cuba. We, I think, uh, I could say that we distributed poverty more or less equally, <laughs> but now what is happening is that some people are concentrating, small groups of people slowly are concentrating, a lot of richness, and these people who are poor are more poor than before. And that is a big challenge for the majority of our people. Some people have lost hope. Some people do not know what's going to happen. There's a, a lot of fear and uncertainty in our people at this moment. But at the same time, new challenges are happening. Challenges that the majority of the Cubans think, uh, appreciate as something positive, but also that scares the Cuban people. But in the general, we can say it's positive. The relations, the new relations with the United States, what will happen in Cuba? What will happen when we will have one million North American as tourists walking around Havana in the cities of Cuba? What will happen when American enterprise will come? What will happen when the new movements, religious movement, neo-charismatic, and all these new movements will come or are coming already? That develops a lot of uncertainty in our people. That is the situation of, of Cuba today. And the churches are challenges because we, as followers of Christ, we are called to bring hope to our people. We are called to bring security for our people. We are called to make our people really feel that God has not abandoned us. And that has been the role of the church for all these 50, more than 50 years. Bringing the message of hope, bringing the message of uh, of certainty for our people in Cuba. God, or Jesus Christ, did not take a plane to Miami in 1959. He stayed in Cuba, and we are witnessing Christ in Cuba today. I would like to give a brief presentation of uh, religion in Cuba, and how the churches insert in this religious, I call it religious map in Cuba. I will, I will have to begin saying that Cuba, or Cubans, we are a very religious people. We say that the persons that uh, do not believe in the Virgin of the Caridad del Cobre, is the patron of Cuba, believes in Ochun, that's her name in the Afro-Cuban, or believe in both. The majority of the Cuban people are religious. The religions of our aborigines was disappeared in the first years of the colonization. The Spanish, the Spanish came to Cuba, but the, they forced our people, the aboriginal people, to do hard work in looking for gold. And many of them died in the mines, many of them died of sickness, and the population of aboriginals in Cuba disappeared totally in the first 15 years. So the religion of the aboriginals are, are in some elements of the religion, religion of the aborigines, but we don't know exactly. The Spanish colony came and brought Christianity, Roman Catholic Christianity to Cuba. And the Roman Catholic Church at that time was a, a church that was 
part of the colonization of our people, any people. So they were, they were instruments and played an important role as the ideological or sustainer of the colonialist system in Cuba. Especially in, in the case of first the aborigines and then the slavery in Cuba. There are some exceptions in this story, in this history. For example, Bartolomé de las Casas, one of the most uh, relevant, I think, uh, uh, priests in the first period of the colonization, was one of the defenders of the aborigines. And Bartolomé de las Casas, very interesting, was a very conservative uh, priest in the, uh, what is now the Dominican Republic. And Bartolomé de las Casas was transformed by a, a, a sermon of another Dominican priest, Montesinos, that his sermon, that was in the Advent, his sermon was about in, in the book of Shida, the book of Shida, where it says that like, like one who kills a son before his father's eyes is the person who offers a sacrifice from the property of the poor. Ben Sina is a very uh, strong book, very strong book at least, uh, defending the poor. And Bartolomé de las Casas transformed himself hearing that, that sermon. And he began to work for the freedom, first of the aborigines, and then of the, of the, no, it was, I'll turn it off now. Turn it off? Okay. Okay. Sorry. No, no problem. And so Bartolomé de las Casas was one of the exceptions in the history of the, of the, of the colonization and the role of the Roman Catholic Church in Cuba at that time. Then the Spanish brought the African slaves to Cuba. It's very interesting that the, from the very beginning, we were, we were speaking about the 16th century, there were, were already slaves in Spain, and they brought their slaves, African slaves. So many people were brought forcibly from Africa, from the west coast of Africa, to Cuba, and uh, from the, especially from the Yoruba people. The Yoruba and the Congos were brought to Cuba. Some historians say that up to the 19th century, one million slaves were brought to Cuba. And, uh, and you can imagine how many of them died in this. But the slaves brought their religion. And especially the Yoruba religion was the, 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 the religion of those slaves. So we have now what we call the Santeria. It's a syncretic religion that comes together with Roman Catholicism in a process of 200 years. And it's very interesting because there's a parallel between the gods of the Yoruba, Santeria, and the saints in the Roman Catholic Church. And many, many, many people are devoted to these saints. For example, the Virgin of Regla. Regla is a, a small town uh, in uh, part of Havana, on the other side of the bay, Regla, and there's a virgin, uh, uh, Mulata, that is a mix of African and, black and white and Spanish, and she is for the African Yemaya. Yemaya is the goddess of the sea, the power. So the Virgin of Regla is Yemaya. And the San Lazaro, a very important saint in the culture and the religion in Cuba, is, the, is Babalua Ye. Interesting is that San Lazaro, and when you go to Cuba, once you uh, have gone to Cuba, very near the Havana is the sanctuary of San Lazaro. And the 17th of December, maybe 1,000, 150,000 people go to the sanctuary of San Lazaro. But if you go there, you will see. Yorubas, you will see Christians, and you will see Presbyterians. You won't see disciples because we don't have disciples in Cuba, but maybe there will, there will be a God also because it's a mix. Cuba, the religion in Cuba is syncretic, and people move from one religion to another. 
interesting. Saint Lazarus of all, but Manuelle is the God of the healing. It's very interesting how these processes are in the, in the history of religion because Saint Lazarus in the, in the Roman Catholic Church is Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha, who in the tradition immigrated to France and was a bishop in France. Saint Lazarus, and in the tradition of the Yoruba that has to do with, with the Baba Luaye is Lazarus from the parable of Lazarus and the rich. So is this man with leper, with the, the dog, and he had the, the stick to walk. And San Lazarus is the god of him. Well, the 17th of December is the day of San Lazarus. And in that day, President Obama and President Castro announced the normalization of the relations between the two countries. Now you can take any conclusion about that. But <laughs> that is uh, one of the most important uh, saints in our tradition, San Lazarus. In the others, for example, the Virgin, the, 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 the devotion to the miracle womb in Havana, uh, in the cemetery of Havana. The cemetery of Havana, as any other uh, Spanish or Latin America cemetery, is a place where you have the art statues and, and different kinds of art. There's a, there's a grave there, it's called the Miracle Room. And the legend says that this woman, when she was buried, she was pregnant. And when they opened the grave two years after, she had the baby in her arms. So they, they began a, a legend around this woman that she would care for babies. So women when are pregnant, or have problems with the health of their small babies, go there and ask her for the health of the. And then you can go there and you will see baby clothes, you will see baby shoes, you will see different things. That's an expression of how religion, this mixed religion in Cuba works. The reality is that we are very syncretic and we move from one religion to another. In the case of the, of, of the churches, I was mentioning that the, well, the first church that came was the Roman Catholic Church uh, through the colonial powers of Spanish colonialism. But then the Protestant churches began to work in Cuba at the end of the 19th century. Interesting in the difference and before that, it was prohibited by the Spanish government because the Roman Catholic was the religion of the Spanish colony, so it wasn't allowed to have any other religion, a Christian religion, because the Africans were allowed to worship in their barracks, the slaves, but there was not allowed any other religion. So the first Protestant churches that came to Cuba was at the end of the 19th century, and the interesting thing, they were created by Cubans that were in exile here in the States because their work for the independent movement in Cuba against Spain. There was an amnesty in the 80s of the, of the 19th century. And these Cubans came back to Cuba. They have learned from different denominations and they came back and founded those churches. The first Protestant non-Catholic church the first non-Catholic church in Cuba was created in Matanzas in 1883 by a Cuban, Reverend Duarte. And from there on, the Presbyterian, the Baptist, the Methodist were in that period between 1883 and 1895. Because all these pastors from these churches were engaged in the independent movement, once our last independent, uh, independent war began, that was 1895, then they closed the churches and went to the liberation army to work as uh, uh, helping in the, with the wounded and so on. So the churches were, were closed. It was not until 1898, the Spanish-American War, where the U.S. Army took over to. And together with the army, the U.S. Army came the missionaries of all of all the denominations that you have here 
uh, in the states. So we have then different churches that were coming in 1898, and they they didn't recover the original founders of the church. They were eliminated. So these churches were part of the U.S. church. And very interesting in the, in the mentality for that time was the issue that there, was, uh, there were not international boards of mission. There were the national boards of mission that came to Cuba and Puerto Rico. Now you can think about then what was in their mind in relation to that, to that because the annexation of Cuba was one of the issues that was discussed as Puerto Rico, there still is a colony. So you have, Cuba was in that discussion. So the churches that came and the missionaries that came were from the National Board of Mission here in the States. And they began to work in different, uh, in the different provinces of Cuba, eliminating the Cubans that were participating in that. So uh, we had then almost an American church. We were organic part of the American church and the majority of the historical churches, the Presbyterian, the Methodist, the Episcopals, and the Baptist, we were part, organic part, of the U.S. churches until the, until the 60s of last century. So our church became, the Presbyterian Reformed Church in Cuba became independent in 1967. And the majority of our churches were independent, autonomous at that moment. So we were part. It was very strange in our case, in the Presbyterian case, it was very strange because we were part, we were a Presbyterian of the city of New Jersey. And then we said, well, uh, what is, the, what is the, the, the issue? The issue was that both Presbyterian churches came and the disciples came to Cuba. But the Northern Church was the one who, the, an agreement that they had, including the disciples, an agreement that they had was the Presbyterian, was the, 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 they would be part of the Church of the North. So that's why we were part of the Church of New Jersey. The disciples worked in Cuba the first years, and then they gave, gave the, the sanctuaries and the builders and the properties to the Presbyterian Church. So we have only one Presbyterian Church in Cuba. That was not the case, for example, of the Baptists. The Southern Baptists came, the, the, the Baptists of the North came, so they found that, that what they did was divide the island. So the Southern Baptist Church were in the east of the island and, and the west of the island, and the North Baptist Church was in the, in the east of the island. But both Baptist uh, the denomination uh, uh, were in Cuba until the late 60s, where, as I said, the majority of our churches uh, uh, were independent from the American churches. We have other denominations. So we have the historical churches, the Presbyterian, the Presbyterian, we have the Quakers, Baptists. The Methodist Church in the last 15 years has moved to a very charismatic church, totally charismatic church. And the Baptists, the two big Baptist conventions are very conservative, but they are very uh, in number. They're, they have a lot of, of, of members, the Methodists and the Baptists, in both Baptist conventions. The Presbyterians, the Episcopals, the Quakers, we are, let's say, a middle in number uh, church. But the biggest uh, traditional historical churches, Baptists and Methodists, are the largest. And they have worked in all in all the island. But we have other other uh, denominations like Pentecostals. We have uh, I I make the difference between historic Pentecostalism. I don't know the historians, but I make that difference between uh, the historic Pentecostalism and the new Pentecostal movements, neo Pentecostal movement. And we have both in Cuba. We have the Seventh Adventist Church. We have and we have also the the Holy Witness that we have here. And it's more than uh, a couple of thousands of Jehovah's Witnesses that we have in Cuba. Other religions. I mentioned the Christians, the Afro-Cubans, the Spiritism is very developed in Cuba. And I was surprised, I read not so long ago, that it came from the States. 
that during the the the, the war, uh, the civil war that you have here, the spiritism movement was very strong here, and they brought it to Cuba at that moment. And we have a, a what we call a cross spiritism that is a mix of spiritism, Cartesian, uh, and other movement of spiritism with Afro Cuban, and they call it cross spiritism. But also we have small groups of Buddhism, Muslims, there's a Jewish community. So we have a number of religions, but this, the, the most in number, the most uh, important are surely the Afro-Cubans and what we can call uh, that uh, Mr. Lazarus or the other religion, what we call the popular religion, the people move from one religion to another. I wanted to, wait, wait, he's going to tell me about <laughs> The other, the other um, issue that I wanted, uh, uh, as introduction, I'm still in the introduction, <laughs> is um, something that I, I'm, I'm always asked, what has happened to the church during these 50 years? I will say, I divided in four moments. The first moment I call it the honeymoon between the Cuban Revolution, 1959, and uh, the revolution, what happened in Cuba. Batista de Taylor was, at that moment, we are speaking about the 50s, at that moment, Batista de Taylor was one of the coolest dictatorships in Latin America. We have wars, we have had later wars, like in Argentina, or Chile, but at that time, Batista was one of the coolest together with Somoza and Nicaragua, was one of the coolest dictators in, in, in Latin America. So the majority of the Cubans were against Batista. So the majority of the Cuban supported the movement that Fidel Castro needed in the mountains, in the Vila War, etc. But, but the hierarchy of the Roman Catholics Church didn't. Many Catholics participated in the struggle against Batista, but the hierarchy, the cardinal, did not was supporting Batista. And that is something that we have to remember when we understand the story, the, the history of that. That was the first period, very short period, because the revolution began to make a, a especially economical measure at the, at the first, the reform, agrarian reform, and what we call the house reform. I mean, in Cuba, there's still a law that you can't own more than one house. You own the house that you live in. Because that was a big business, the only, uh, the, the, to rent houses. And as a difference between the Roman Catholic Church and the, the Roman Catholic Church in Cuba and in Latin America, in Latin America, the Roman Catholic Church owns land. But in Cuba, the Roman Catholic Church owned properties, houses. And that was the main income, one of the main incomes of the Roman Catholic Church. Because in Cuba, the United Food Company was the one who owned the land. So, when the reform came, that was a, a shock for the, for the church. But then, was we were trapped in the middle of the Cold War. So, we imported all this Marxist dogmatic understanding, atheist conceptions. And the, this second period, the second period began at that moment when Cuba was declared, I'm, I'm speaking about 1961, 62, when to Cuba was declared a socialist country and with a communist ideology, an atheist ideology. That provoked a confrontation between the Roman Catholic Church that was until 1951, during the colonial time and during the Republic, was the an official official, during the colonial time, they were the official church of the government. During the republic, they were the unofficial official church. <laughs> because we, we, in our constitutions, our state, from the first constitutions, is a lay state. But in reality, the Roman Catholic Church was the official church. So, at that moment, losing all the privilege, losing the economical, and with the ideological aspect, there was a big conflict. Our churches, Protestant churches, 
American churches had, and you remember, in the 50s, Marcantism, there was a very strong anti-communist ideology, and people were afraid of communism, totally afraid of communism. Even there was a propaganda, and there has been very, uh, very painful stories uh, of that period. Because uh, one of the things that the U.S. government did at the beginning of the revolution was to create a, a situation where they began to say that the children will be, will be taken away from the parents and sent to Russia. The people believed that. And then they opened here what is called the Peter Pan operation. And many humans sent their children to the U.S. alone. And then the, the, the diplomacy relations broke and they didn't see their children, maybe 30, and sometimes they didn't see their children. And thousands of children were sent to the U.S. sponsored by the Roman Catholic Church here. So that was, that was a very difficult moment at that time. But there was a concentrated uh, um, um, a fight between Roman Catholic, but also Protestant. Ideologically, we were against because we were uh, more North Americans, all the confrontation with the U.S., and also all the ideology. So our churches, Protestant churches, also had a moment of conflict. But at the same time, the government with the atheist, atheism was a religion for the government. So the government, again, uh, imposed discrimination against, uh, against Christians, against religion, and against Christians. And for example, a Christian couldn't be a teacher in a, in a primary school, they couldn't go to certain careers in the university. You were asking, our, our children were asked if they were Christian in, in, in the school, and they laughed at them because they were uh, you know, idealists and all that. So there was a moment of strong competition. I would say 80% of the graduates of Matanza Seminary up to 1961, 62, immigrated to the United States. 80%. So you can imagine what that meant for the church and for the pastors of our churches in, in Cuba at that moment. And we was, I could say that that period went up to the end of the 80s, 1980s. It began to change slowly. And I think it began to change for different reasons. One, uh, the theology of liberation in Latin America, and the influence of the theology of liberation in Latin America. Two, uh, there was a book, very famous book in, in 1984, I think, 86, that Fray Beto, a, a Brazilian priest, made an interview to Fidel Castro. And for the first time, Fidel Castro gave very positive opinions about religion and about Christianity. He was, he was raised in a Jesuit school, so he was Jesuit. So the, he gave a very positive uh, uh, explanation about religion at that time. So these factors began to have an influence, and in the 90s, the change began. That means change of dialogue between the churches. There was a big meeting uh, between church leaders and Fidel Castro discussing the issue of discrimination and persecution against Christians. And change began at that moment. And that, what I would say, was the beginning of our third period, where slowly, very slowly, the discrimination the limitations. I wouldn't say we had persecution. Nobody went to jail, although there's a lot of stories about that. But nobody, nobody went to jail because of religion. They went to jail because also they had political activities. No? So uh, that was the third period that began slowly. And now we're living a very special moment of dialogue. The three, we have received the visit of uh, three popes in a row. The three last pope have visited Cuba, and that's not the, something that is casual. So, uh, and the, the issue that John Paul II visited Cuba was an important issue in relation to uh, the openness of the government in, in relation to that. And this pope, you, you saw him, him here, 
very charismatic, with a very positive uh, speech, this Pope really uh, had an impact in the Cuban society right now, and in the government. And the Catholic Church, one of our concerns as Protestant churches, in, as uh, Cuban Council of Churches, is that the Catholic Church again begins to have a very close relation with the government. It's like a slowly reinstallation of the influence of the Catholic Church in politics, directly in politics, indirectly in the society in Cuba. The visit of the popes, the, the commemoration of the 400 years of the appearance of the, of the patron of Cuba, the Virgin of the Caridad of Covid, those were events, that public events, that the border between separation, state, and church was sometimes moved a little bit in relation to the Roman Catholic Church. And that is one of the concerns of the Protestant churches at this moment. What would happen after the visit of uh, Pope Francis, the influence of Pope Francis, what will happen? Because there are two issues, two issues, important issues, and uh, uh, two important issues. One is that the Roman Catholic Church wants to have religion in schools. The Protestant churches have been always against that. We have private schools, but we have private schools before the revolution because the education was awful. And we have primary schools. There were small schools right beside, uh, right beside the churches. But it was for people who were poor. Roman Catholic Church had big schools for the rich in Cuba at that time. So that's one of the things that Pope Francis asked, and they're looking at. The other thing is a privatization of some sectors of the Cuban society. And the other issue is the communication, public media. That belongs to the state. But if the Roman Catholic it has that possibility, then it will be a big problem for, for other religions. Because what we say, I said, what the Protestant and Cuban Council said, it, it said, says, if we are going to open, you have to open for all the religions. You can't open only for the Roman Catholic Church. You can have a privilege for one religion and not to others. And the Afro Cubans will be asking for that also. And the other issue where the, where the, where the Protestant churches really made uh, and gave an important moment was in theological education and in theological reflection. I'll put two examples. One is the Seminar of Matanzas. The Seminar of Matanzas was founded in 1946, and one of the main things of Matanzas Seminar is the production, theological production of our center and the impact in the society that we have tried. And now we have the Institute of Religious, Interreligious Studies now, Science of Religion, we call it. The other example is that the Presbyterian Reformed Church in 1977 proclaim a confession of faith. It's the only confession of faith in a socialist country with a strong theological basis. So that has been to finish in our last question. And I wanted to point out theologically, what are our emphasis? It has to do with my class. I have two students here. We think our theology, our theology that we have done. First, theology is contextual, so we do contextual so like consciously. For us, if you want to recognize it or not, theology is contextual. We do it consciously. The other is our theological approach is political. You have to take the political risk. That doesn't mean you have to be in politics in the sense that we are part of the police. We are part of, the, of, of, of our country, and anything that we do has a political impact. There's nothing more false, from our point of view, than to say you are apolitical. Because even saying apolitical, you're political. So that, and you have to take the risk for it. You have to take the risk at church, as Jesus did. The other is, as Protestant reform, biblical. 
we are we emphasize in the study of the Bible, and the Bible is our reference, and the Bible is also full textbook. We have Bible experts here. That means that for us, the more deeper you go in the context of the passage of the Bible, the more impact that will have when you do the hermeneutic jump to our times. But you have to understand the context of the Bible. The more you understand that, the more impact that, and the Bible is misused. Misused a lot. So that's one of the, of it. and the other thing is that our theology is missiological. We do theology, I, I wanted to, but we can leave that to the definition of theology. But we do theology as a critical understanding of the mission of the church, the practice of the church. I will put it this way. Theology is the map of faith. We have to change our maps because the reality changes, but it's the map of faith that brings us to the kingdom of God. And we have to work for the kingdom of God of justice and peace. And to end, this is really the end. <laughs> we are living in the United States and Cuba a very special moment. The churches has, have played a very important role during all these years. I think we have been the, we have been called by God to be the bridges between our people. The walls are falling, and we have to. And that's something that we feel deeply, and I want to share with you from my heart. We have to do more to destroy that wall. We are so close, so near. We are people that are together. We deserve to be together. And let's work together to change that totally and to work for the future, not only of our countries, because we have here and you a lot of problems, no? And you have here a lot of problems in the university, and right? No? So we have a lot of problems. But we have to work together to change the world. But in relation to our two countries, let's finish to eliminate that awful wall that politics made up. Thank you. And I will I will I will say the first. If you want to walk up to the microphone speak to your door we can pass the word. If you don't have much I can continue speaking don't worry. <laughs> So as we normalize relations between the United States and Cuba, I wonder what your um, hopes and fears are about uh, changes that might occur in Cuba. Yeah, I mentioned, um, I think it's good because of the reasons I told you. We, we, the history of Cuba is the history of the